Hi, I'm Scott Boltman from Froebel USA, and I wanted to take this time to provide some context about the Froebel gifts. I know a lot of you are very interested to learn more, and you're frustrated sometimes, and it's very confusing. Um, and one of the things I think I can do best is to help provide some context for how this stuff got as confusing as it is. So, Froebel actually developed his gifts uh, over decades of observing children. Um, his basic concept was to give children concrete, solid, whole forms to begin with. Um, the first uh, gift was a, a ball, a yarn ball, uh, a soft knitted uh, cotton worsted ball. Um, because a, a, a small uncoordinated hand can, can grip it, um, it has the uh, ability to roll and it seemingly has a life of its own. Uh, his intention was this would be something given to infants in that mothers could hang, they could suspend this in front of a, a child in a, in a crib, um, and that they could have uh, using this as a way of forming visual acuity. But the concept was to start with a whole form and then transition from the concrete to the abstract. So uh, first they introduced the yarn ball, the next thing introduced uh, was a wood ball. And generally when you will introduce these, uh, you will show both of them to a child so they can see that they're very similar. They both roll, they're both about the same size, uh, but this is made out of a different substance and you could even talk about that. How does it feel? How does it smell? How does it sound? All of these things are opportunities for children to learn science, essentially. Um, and one of the things that uh, is so fascinating about Froebel was he put a lot of time into thinking how children play. And he developed uh, an idea that there's really only three things that you can do with these materials, and he called them forms. Forms of life, forms of knowledge, and forms of beauty. So forms of life are representing things that a child knows. So, for instance, a red ball could be an apple or a cherry or something along those lines. Um, forms of knowledge are what is the name of this? This is a sphere. Um, how many do I have? And all of those things which provide concrete information. And then the third and the final way, there was really only three possibilities, was uh, forms of beauty, which would be abstract patterning, um, symmetrical patterning. So he introduced uh, the whole form of the sphere, gift one, and then gift two. Now why did he name them? Uh, with numbers, he named them not only because there's a sequence of abstraction, but more importantly, how do you describe a set that gives you a sphere, a cylinder, and a cube, and a hanging apparatus to suspend it on? I mean, at some point, you just simply have to give it a name, and so he referred to it as GIF2. Um, the idea behind GIF2 is essentially it's a science experiment. You suspend these solids. Uh, I use a detent pen, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you can suspend these uh, from an apparatus and you can spin them by pushing this string up and down. And one of the things I also want to bring up, uh, changes that I've introduced uh, that I actually feel good about, um, relates to GIF2. Now, in most of the world, you're going to see uh, the solids have these little metal eyelets, and they use them in conjunction with a little metal fish hook as a way of suspending them. And uh, while I know that that will work, uh, there were a couple problems with that. First of all, uh, when you have a solid like this and it has eyelets, it's not going to roll. So that's kind of a bummer. But more of a bummer is uh, that this fish hook doesn't pass safety testing for two reasons. First of all, this will fit in a choke tube. And second of all, you know, it's a fish hook. Um, I think working with uh, fish hooks in children would be great if you were in a boat taking them fishing. Um, but in this case, it's not necessary. So one of the things that we've done is to use this detent pin, um, which allows you to insert this into the side and spin it that way. 
Um, this does not fit in the choke tube and it does pass safety testing so that is why we do that. Um, we also provide a stick that you can put in here and you can spin the solid this way and what happens is there's an optical illusion. You can see within the spinning cylinder that there's actually a, a, a solid, a more solid form of a sphere and so his idea was that you would see that there's a connection between the cylinder and the sphere and, and technically what that is is if you take a sphere and you move it horizontally through space in a straight line you're actually creating a cylindrical form in space so these patterns uh, are what uh, Froebel was trying to get through and if you take a sphere and you take a cube then and you spin the cube you will have a cylindrical pattern you'll see the cylinder inside the cube so that there's a connection between this and this so uh, that's what gift 2 does but there's a lot more that can be done um, through forms of life forms of knowledge forms of beauty children will find all sorts of amazing things to do you can include the box uh, there will be all sorts of imaginative play activities that you can do with this, but I like to think of it as a science experiment. Then once you have this uh, two-inch cube, um, you can introduce the other gifts. Uh, gift three is the same form. It's a cube form, but it is now divided into eight equal one-inch cubes this smaller cube does represent the whole of the larger cube. But Froebel purposely limited the number of pieces of blocks so that children would have to um, be challenged to represent things, forms of life. So if there was a prompt, for instance, uh, that you would give a child, you might say, what would you like to do this summer? And the child may take the cubes and try to find some way to represent something that they would like to do during the summertime. Now, I went internal. I thought about boating. I thought about being out on the lake in a boat. So now I've represented uh, a boat in this way. Now, another child might think the same thing. They might think, I'd like to go out on the lake in a boat. But they might make a boat sort of three-dimensionally, like a tugboat. I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to turn it on its side like this. Or turn it around this way. So every child, if you ask them to make a boat, they will go internal. They will think about what a boat looks like. They will all three, four, five children around a table have a different idea of what a boat looks like. They will manifest it. You will observe that they've made a boat and you will have a window into what's going on inside the child. Uh, well, then what a teacher might do if there's a group of children sitting around uh, might engage them in a story about all of their boats that were out on the lake. Uh, children have a tendency to remember all of the things that went on during a gift play because the story is so memorable that they can recreate what happened based on the story itself. So forms of life, forms of knowledge, forms of beauty. So you can say for forms of knowledge you could count and multiply. If you have eight cubes and I take half of them away, how many are left? Um, you can cut this in half a bunch of different ways and show that the children, by counting them again, that it's exactly the same number. How many surfaces does a cube have? And you can count that there are six. How many edges does a cube have? These are all forms of knowledge. Forms of beauty would be an abstract pattern. And there are lots of ways to work this. Now, there are designs in a lot of the books, a lot of the booklets, even the stuff that we print. Uh, we provide you with some of these designs. But it's not uh, that you need to make those patterns. There aren't a series of patterns. There are patterns that can certainly be made with cubes. Um, but the idea is to explore them on your own, not to make them. Now, is it educational? Well, technically, it's a test of spatial literacy to see if you can look at a two-dimensional representation and to manifest that in three dimensions. In fact, that particular Froebel activity was turned into the Weschler uh, intelligence scale uh, back during World War I, 
they use these kinds of cubes and those kinds of uh, taking two-dimensional forms and representing them in three dimensions as a way to see if their soldiers had spatial literacy. Um, so while you can do that, you can have a child make these pictures, it's not what Froebel intended. In fact, if you see people giving children something printed during a Froebel activity, just know that that's not what Froebel wanted. It's 180 degrees different. He was trying to see what was going on inside of them. Um, but there are different agendas, and some people uh, want to test the spatial literacy. Some people want to express something else. Um, one of the challenges, as you're finding, is trying to learn about these uh, materials is uh, you're seeing that there are some places that have activity books. Um, and again, these are, this is not what Froebel intended. Froebel did not uh, make a guide. He did not create activity books. He certainly had the capacity to, uh, but this was not what he wanted. However, um, in these cultures that have these activity books, they are using their Froebel materials in a didactic way. They're using them to teach, to instruct. That's not what Froebel intended, but I can see that this is what they're intending to do. So when you see this kind of stuff, you know that that's what it is. They're, ba they're making curriculum effectively, um, but it's not what Froebel wanted. So uh, there were essentially only six gifts. Uh, they were the solids. Uh, Froebel stopped at six, although he had on his drafting board uh, of making two more block sets, a gift seven and a gift eight, which instead of being two inch cubes were four inch cubes that were uh, broken down into even smaller pieces. The, the idea behind the materials was starting with a whole form, like a sphere or a whole cube, and to show how these whole forms can be made uh, out of different, um, different ways of breaking up the same volume into ever smaller and more complex pieces, so that what he was hoping to achieve with children is that as they saw parts and pieces, they would see that they are all part of a larger whole. We as a species are part of this whole, that everything on this planet is part of our ecosystem. Um, and he was trying to get this very subtle message out there. When using the materials, Freibel only really had two rules, I guess, for lack of a better term, that you use every piece, so you can't say, well, I only need these seven to make what I want to make he would say, find something that you can make this eighth piece into as part of your design. And then once you've made your design, don't just knock it down. If you've made a design and it's not what you want, modify it. I think that's a very valuable lesson uh, for children in their lives. If your life isn't going the way you want it, you don't want to start over. You want to make a change in your life and move into a direction that's more positive. So in any way, these uh, six materials uh, are gifts. Now, after Froebel died, his followers took this system to the rest of the world, which is why we have kindergarten, but they also introduced their own ideas about these materials. So, for instance, Hermann Goldamer developed Gift 5B, uh, Milton Bradley uh, developed the uh, curvilinear gift. So, it was essentially businessmen who uh, expanded these uh, materials and added more. So people come to me all the time and they say, where's gift 11? Where's gift 13? I thought there were 20 gifts. There really are only six gifts, but there are many other materials that can be used in a Frobelian way. And let me show you some of those now. So once you get through all of the solid forms, you can move on to the two-dimensional forms. And one of the ways that Freibel introduced these uh, what I would call the surface gift. Some people call them tablets. They're also known as gift seven because it came after the, the blocks. Is to take uh, these tablets, which are one inch square by an eighth of an inch, or actually technically a sixth, a sixth of an inch, because if you stack six of them up, it forms one inch cube. Um, now the reason why there are six is because there are six sides of a cube. And so Froebel wanted children to see that these surfaces could be attached this way. And you can also take them and lay them out into what geometers call the net. 
So if you were to have a, a scrap of paper and you cut it into that form, you could wrap the cube. These are the surfaces of the cube. So um, we offer the tablets, the surface gift, um, in a natural form for this very reason. But most often you will see these one inch tablets in different colors. Uh, and these colors are great for making all sorts of mosaic patterns and you want to be able to use lots of different colors. Um, but there are some valid reasons to use a natural uh, color as well. So now we're abstracted to 2D. Another material that Froebel used, which he was able to um, not number, is the sticks. And again, um, the sticks are based on a one inch system. So you'll have a one inch stick, a two inch stick, a three inch stick, up to five, six, sometimes beyond. Um, and then there are uh, sticks that you can use to um, construct letters. So if you wanted to, I'm trying to, well, let's make something that actually spells something. Um, so you can do this. This would be a form of knowledge, um, but uh, I think it would be great to leave it up to the child to construct this based on their own exploration of language versus using it in a didactic, instructive way. So the line would be the next gift, a line gift. Now there are straight lines, but there are also curved lines. One of the things that I did to create confusion in the Froebel system was when we first started making these back in the mid-90s, um, I decided that there should be nine gifts because they would be single-digit numbers, so gifts one through nine. The tablets were seven, the lines, both straight and curved, would be eight, and the nine would be the point, the point gift. And then at that point, there's a recapitulation where you're coming back to a representation of three-dimensional space using only the point and the line. We would think of things like uh, Tinker Toys or Zone Tool or uh, Buckminster Fuller used cork and wire or peas and toothpicks as a way of representing three-dimensional space using only the point and the line. Um, that felt to me like it was, it was a recapitulation at a higher level. So you're coming back around to 10, which is a one with a zero on the end, so a, a factor of 10. Um, so that made sense to me, so I went ahead and did it. Uh, what I probably should have done is what I'm doing now, which is I'm referring to these things in, in specific uh, language. So line gift, you know, straight line, curve line, a surface gift, point gift. Um, so what people have asked me, where's gift 10, where's gift 11, where's gift 13? Um, this is some context to understand that these materials have a trajectory in terms of from concrete to abstract, but there really is no limitation. Um, in fact, one of the interesting things is um, in other parts of the world, instead of a two inch sphere, you would have a 60 millimeter sphere. Um, instead of a one inch cube, you have a 30 millimeter cube, which is about an inch and an eighth. Um, and it's nice, they're, they're a little bit bigger and easier to hold and it's nice. It costs a little more because it's more wood, um, but effectively what happened 100 years ago in the United States was they decided to make these Froebel blocks bigger uh, so they could be played on the floor. And so people um, now call them kindergarten blocks or unit blocks. They're essentially Froebel gifts made at a much higher scale. Um, and at the time, they uh, tried to talk people out of using the smaller Froebel gift size, the, the one inch size. They said that children didn't like little things and that by playing with small pieces, it was going to affect their eyesight or their muscle control, which we now know is not true at all. But um, this is why blocks have gotten bigger over time. And then back in the 1970s, 1980s, as the cost of wood began to skyrocket, you're now beginning to see blocks getting smaller and smaller. So, um, so this is just a brief introduction into uh, some ideas about the Froebel gifts. I've been on a 25-year journey. I've been all over the world. I've seen how they're used. Um, 
there's a lot that I can share with you, but I don't want to give you information you don't want or don't need. So what I'm suggesting is if this is the kind of information that you're looking for, please um, subscribe to our channel, like this video, and by all means leave questions in the comments. I will either reply to your questions there or I'll probably do a video about it because if you're interested, there's probably somebody else that's interested in well. So um, please uh, like, subscribe, and comment below, and we'll keep making these videos. Thank you.